Uh, dear colleagues, uh, first I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk in here. And this session is about uh, omics. Uh, I will uh, try to define first what is the most important omics for us, uh, namely immunome. What is immunomics? Uh, there's two, two figures in here. Uh, I'm going to talk about this part, this part today. Uh, in recent times, I've been talking more about what is there and up in there, but variations in, in the immune system. But uh, uh, the concentration today is about immunome. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in first, I will start by describing what is immunome, uh, what, how, and where. Uh, discuss properties of the immunome and to look at the genetics and evolution of the immune system, then uh, interactions within the immunome proteins, uh, discuss about how to identify novel candidate genes, uh, classify immunodeficiencies, and uh, finally about systems biology. So I try to cover lots of things related to, to immunomics today. Uh, by immunome, we need the entirety of the genes and proteins that are essential for, for the immune system. Immune system is really a, a kind of a, a bunch or pack full of different kinds of, uh, of uh, mechanism, reactions, processes, and so on, which during the evolution have been uh, utilized for uh, protecting the organisms. So it covers lots of different molecules, different uh, uh, cells, even tissues. And uh, uh, we wanted to have an idea what all this is, I mean combined, what is immunome. And to do that, we collected information from databases, textbooks, and literature to, to first find out those genes and proteins which are truly essential for the immune system. Uh, there is lots of processes and, and genes proteins which are important for, for immune system. Let's take DNA replication or energy metabolism. These are things which are important for all the cells, but they are not specific for the immune system, and thereby they are not, not included. So we have a strict criteria for what belongs to the immunome. And, and uh, these um, proteins have to be expressed in the, in the immune system related cells and not widely outside them. And we were also looking only at the complete genes. Uh, so we left out uh, all the uh, B and T cell receptors, MHC system, and so on. Uh, all this data is available in a, a dedicated database called IKP, Immunome Knowledge Base, uh, which, uh, as we are uh, dealing with omics, uh, contains lots of different kinds of information. This is really uh, a good example about uh, bioinformatic data integration. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, we start with the, with the genes and proteins in the immune system and collect this data from different sources. Then we have the sequences for, for uh, these genes, proteins, uh, in addition to lots of additional information uh, from, from uh, diverse sources, uh, namely uh, sequence databases. Uh, then there's information about uh, orthologs of the genes in immune system. I will discuss more closely this. Uh, then for the evolutionary studies, we co collect information about the uh, uh, corresponding genes in other organisms. Uh, and, and data for those is in here. And then we have still one additional type of data in here. Uh, here, these uh, sources provide information about variations 
in the immune system genes and proteins, including uh, uh, single nucleotide variations, copy number variations, and so on. And also on the protein level, including post-translational modifications. All this uh, data is, is collected and available in, in IKP, immunoknowledge space. I know this is too busy slide for you to, to read, uh, but this is here just to indicate that uh, uh, the website for the database has been built so that you can perform your own queries and address your own questions with the database. And, and uh, it includes uh, uh, all the data I'm going to discuss today and, and even some more, which I don't have time to, to discuss. And there is, for example, evolutionary trees available for all the uh, about 900 uh, uh, proteins, genes in the immune system. And uh, when having this compendium of data, it becomes possible to perform lots of different kinds of studies. And, and uh, I will discuss uh, some of these uh, applications. But first about the immuno. Uh, based on this analysis already a couple of years back, we uh, identified about 900 uh, genes and proteins. And this is human immunome, indeed. Uh, there's, uh, at that time, there was uh, 177 disease-related uh, genes known. Uh, some other information about those which are in the plasma membrane, which are extracellular receptors, and so on. Uh, this kind of genomic study wouldn't be complete without looking at the pseudogenes. Uh, you are probably familiar with the concept of pseudogene. These are copies of uh, uh, real legitimate uh, uh, genes, but they are not functional for a number of reasons. Most common ones are, are kind of copies of RNAs, and, and these accumulate uh, uh, at fast rate variations. So we found uh, close to 300 novel pseudogenes, uh, which were not known uh, before this was published, and, and uh, uh, thousands of uh, pseudogene fragments. This was an interesting study to do something different uh, uh, and really combining the immunological knowledge, knowledge together. Uh, for the pseudogene analysis, we ended up in, in making our own tool called Pseudogene Quest. Unfortunately, this isn't available anymore. Uh, when I uh, moved from the university, this turned out to be too difficult to, to take with us because there were so many moving parts in there. Anyhow, uh, this is indicating here what we what we did. I'm not going to walk you through all of this, but indicate some things in here. Uh, so, uh, we were looking in here real genes and exons. We, we found actually some, some exons, are not known at that time, uh, and it's possible to find real genes as well. Uh, pseudogene fragments, we can have, uh, find real pseudogenes and those which are duplicated, and those which are interrupted process pseudogenes. And then there's a group for miscellaneous uh, 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 fragments or pseudogenes. So this can be uh, described really in a uh, defined way. And, and uh, considering the evolution, Pseudogenes are really an important reservoir of uh, uh, genetic material which can be used for, for uh, evolution, for uh, generating novel activities and novel genes. Uh, in this uh, study, we were looking at uh, orthologs. Orthologs are um, genes, proteins, in other organisms which have uh, the same function as the gene of our interest. Uh, then there are paralogs, which are uh, related genes, 
in the same or other organisms. And homologs are, well, whatever, something that is related. So the terminology is important in here. Uh, information about the uh, orthologs is available in, in, in some databases and uh, uh, we actually ended up in, in doing this ortholog analysis ourselves because we couldn't find the information for all the, all the genes from existing resources. Uh, in the interest of time, I, I uh, skip in here. So the ortholog is the gene having the same function or the or the gene product is having the same function in other organism. And uh, the way to look at this is to do what is called for reciprocal blasting. We take the gene of interest, blast that against another organism, get the best hit in there, then we take that hit in the other organism and blast it back to human. And it has to be the top hit in both ways to be considered as a morphine. Uh, when there are uh, more of these orthologs, we come to like a situation like this, that uh, genes are related to each other. Uh, we call this kind of situation as level one uh, orthologs, where the genes are, are true orthologs of each other uh, uh, in this tree, but not every ortholog is an, a real ortholog another one. Uh, that is a more stringent requirement, which is in here, so that also uh, these two genes in here have to be orthologs. The information about these different categories is available in the IKP database. Well, this is uh, necessary background information for us for, for making the analysis, and there was lots of this kind of work we had to do. Uh, when having this, this immunome data, it becomes possible to perform a comparative a genomics. In this case, uh, uh, we were comparing the human mouse. Mouse is the uh, common uh, uh, model organism, uh, widely studied. Uh, there's a symphony between human genes and those in, in, in mouse, and there is from uh, one to uh, five uh, uh, chromosomes in, in uh, uh, mouse. For example, here we have chromosome 19. It has uh, the corresponding genes in, in five different chromosomes in mouse. Uh, there are no uh, immunological genes in Y chromosome, and chromosome 8 is missing in here because those genes don't have uh, anything um, similar in mouse at all. Uh, so we generated the evolution for about 900 uh, genes and proteins in there. And uh, then we started to look at the immune system, how it has evolved. Uh, there would be 900 different stories to tell here about all the individual uh, uh, genes in there. But instead of that, I'm, I'm giving you a glimpse of some examples. Uh, here we were looking at uh, uh, classifications of the, of the genes. In this case, with gene ontology terms. And we have collected some of those uh, uh, frequently in here. And we can see that there is a different paths of evolution. We have different evolutionary uh, stages in here, starting from eukaryota, uh, first ancestors of the eukaryotes, uh, organisms having the um, uh, nucleus, and going all the way to, to human in here. And there is a number of functions like the black one in here, which is for blood coagulation. Uh, where the new functions are added pretty much in a constant uh, uh, phase throughout evolution. So here we have the levels, evolutionary levels, and here we have the percentage of the genes in uh, these uh, functions. But then there are some really interesting cases in here, like the red one in here, which is for uh, chemokine activity, 
this one for T-cell activation and uh, IgG binding. Uh, these activities uh, evolve or appear in the evolution, all of them, or almost all of them, just in the, uh, one single uh, step in the evolution. Very interesting indeed, so that the whole uh, process is coming there fully functional, or at least all the, all the, all the genes appear at the same time. Uh, so this is very exciting from the evolutionary point of view. Uh, the same uh, applies also to the functions. We classified these uh, um, genes into, into categories. Uh, here, the, um, the evolution is more constant, but there is still some examples which have kind of quantum leaves where in one step lots of uh, novel activities are included. Of course, what this is in indicating is the uh, history of the existing genes. So we, um, uh, we can't know exactly what the function originally has been when they have emerged during the evolution. Uh, uh, further to the comparison of human and mouse, uh, we can, well, this is an important thing for many of the uh, things that come afterwards <laughs> about uh, the race and analysis of the variations about synonymous and non-synonymous substitutions, uh, which we calculate with or, or indicate with measures called Ka and Ks. So Ka is the ratio of the non-synonymous uh, variations in non-synonymous sites. Uh, and the ratio of these, which is there in the, in, in the bottom, uh, for, for different uh, uh, groups of genes in here, this indicates about the different kinds, what kind of evolution there is behind. So when the value is small, we have uh, very conserved sequences. Whereas uh, when the ratio is high, uh, then we can consider there to be positive selection, uh, directed evolution. Uh, in the next step, we, we collected in information about uh, the interactions of the immunome uh, uh, proteins. So this is the interactome, immunome interactome. Protein-protein interactions taken from the HPRD database, and uh, uh, we get this kind of, uh, of network. Many of you have seen, seen this before. Uh, something you probably haven't seen before is that we can here indicate with the colors uh, the evolutionary levels when these uh, uh, activities were first emerged during the evolution. As far as I know, uh, this is the first and maybe still the, the, the only uh, evolutionary interactome of this size which have been, have been generated. And we can look at the same thing in here as an animation how these activities, how the genes are, are added to the system step by step. And we end up here into the human. Well, uh, this, we have here a network. We have the, the uh, genes and proteins indicated by the ovals in there, and then we have their interactions indicated by the connecting lines. During the last 15 years or so, there has been lots of studies about uh, properties of networks. And uh, this is a so-called small world network, uh, which means uh, that uh, Although the, uh, the uh, individual genes here are not connected maybe to that many other genes, still the path through the network from one, uh, one gene to another is usually pretty short. You have pretty, uh, most likely heard about uh, that every human in the world is about six handshakes from anybody else in the world. Uh, since I know somebody who knows somebody, who knows somebody, who knows in the end uh, Barack Obama or whoever. Uh, so, so this is how it goes. And this is 
a bank feature of small world networks. Uh, more mathematically, we are, can look at uh, uh, power law exponent in here. For the small world networks, these uh, exponents are typically between 2 and 3, which is the case in here uh, on, on, uh, on the different levels. On the level 7, there are just a few uh, genes in there, new, few proteins, a few interactions, so the variation is high and, and the value is not that that reliable. Anyhow, this indicates that we have a true uh, small world network. Another feature of these networks is that uh, the so-called preferential attachment rule, which uh, in practice means that uh, rich get richer. Uh, those uh, nodes which have plenty of connections, they are likelier to get the, uh, new connections when new players, in this case new proteins, are added to the system. And again, in here we are looking at the degrees, which means the number of, con uh, number of uh, connections on the x-axis, on the different evolutionary level, and we see that on, on many levels, like level 1 in here, and so on, we have very statistically significant uh, enrichment into those uh, nodes, uh, which have uh, uh, new connections compared to the old nodes in the, in the system. So, this is really a, a biological evidence for the preferential attachment rule. Uh, then looking at the, more carefully at the, at the proteins in here, we were looking at the, how conserved they are, and we use uh, a measure called entropy to work at that. Based on those uh, uh, families of orthologous uh, sequences, we can calculate entropy and, and correlate that to the degree. So the degree is here, the number of uh, connections, and the entropy is in here. And we can see that uh, in this end of the figure, okay, the, the average is pretty much the same, but the variation is very high in here. Towards this end, where we have high degree, the entropy is never high. Uh, this implies that uh, conserved uh, genes have uh, uh, high numbers of, of interactions. And this is what is evident also in here when we are looking all over, over the individual uh, levels in the, in the system. So, uh, conserved genes are more likely to uh, have additional interactions when new genes are and proteins are introduced. Another thing about to look at from, from the uh, network is that we can look at many different parameters and features. We can calculate at least 50 different uh, characteristics for the networks. We were looking at many of those in here and, and found two of these to be especially interesting. Efficiency, this tells about how effectively the uh, information is transferred between the uh, nodes, between the proteins in the network. And vulnerability is a measure about what happens to the network when we have a kind of knockout. When we take one node, one protein out, and all its connecting partners, what happens to the network uh, mathematically? And, and uh, we calculated this for all the possible um, levels in here. And this is what we see, that efficiency is going up during evolution. This is surprising because according to the theory of the small world networks, it actually should go like this. Uh, so, so in biological systems, uh, there is uh, features which uh, just like robustness, uh, redundancy and so on, which likely contribute towards this, this uh, effect. And we see the same thing here with the vulnerability, that really the robustness of the system, uh, the, the knockout, uh, when we go further in the evolutionary states, they are basically, or on average, less severe than uh, earlier in the evolution. So, uh, uh, based on this evolutionary information in there, 
we then uh, moved on to look at uh, uh, what's there behind the evolution and, and what kind of uh, selective pressure have uh, shaped uh, the, uh, the immune system. So uh, this, to do that, we, we collected information about the variations in the system, in the immune system, not only in, in, in one or two genes, but in all of them, whenever the data is available. And we are looking here for two kinds of, of evolution, so-called directional uh, evolution or directional selection, which is uh, means positive or also called for Mendelian uh, selection. And then we have balancing uh, selection, which aims at keeping the things as they are to to keep them conserved. So these are, these are two extremes of the of the spectrum. There in the uh, middle we have neutral mutual selection. And we were looking at the, uh, the uh, proteins in the immune system, uh, how they distributed into these uh, two extreme classes, directed and balancing selection classes. To do that, we uh, needed information about uh, another omics, uh, this time about variome. Uh, we have in this table different functional categories, which we already introduced in the immunome knowledge space. And then uh, from diverse sources, we were lo looking at uh, copy number variations, single nucleotide variations, uh, disease-causing variations, splice variants, and post-transitional modifications of proteins. Uh, we, uh, in, in, in our group, we are having about 130 uh, databases for primary immunodeficiency uh, variations. But we included also other, other databases in here. And you can see the total numbers in here. So um, we were having thousands and thousands of data, data points in here. So the results are, can be considered pretty reliable. Uh, we performed a comparison in here between mouse and human once again. Uh, and on the x-axis, we have Ka, Ks values, uh, the ratio of these synonymous and non-synonymous uh, substitutions in corresponding sites. Uh, this uh, uh, information is here is for the density of the data. So the density is quite similar when we compare to uh, y-axis, where we have uh, uh, another a noble uh, measure where we have Pn ratio to Ps. And this is looking for the uh, single nucleotide uh, uh, or variations in these uh, uh, proteins. And uh, uh, the, those uh, which have the uh, KAKS value below 0.2 in here, these are considered as, as conserved based on, on previous notes. And, and those uh, which have the PNPS ratio below uh, 1, these we, we think to be directed. We exclude this part in here, so we have directed genes which are evolved by the directed, directed evolution, they are in here, and those which are uh, applying to conserved evolution, they are in here. And then we compare these two classes in here uh, to see whether there are any differences between them. And we, we did lots of different things. Uh, here are some results. It may, may look that there are now hardly no, no differences in here, but actually all the results here are statistically significant. And, uh, uh, well, this is a good example. Just looking at the size, the uh, molecular weight of the, of the proteins. So uh, here we have the immunome proteins, all of them. Uh, the uh, uh, directed uh, pro genes coded, uh, proteins coded by, <laughs> uh, by genes and the directed evolution 
they are in here and, and they have clear peak here below 50,000. Whereas the uh, conserved proteins, they have a different shape and, and, and uh, can be uh, much larger. Uh, we were looking at a large number of different uh, uh, features in here. And this is a summary from the paper we published, I think, three years ago. Uh, and we can see that uh, there are differences in certain, uh, certain uh, gene ontology terms. Uh, there are more uh, single nucleotide variations in the direct genes and also the coding regions in the direct genes than in the, in the conserved genes. Uh, and there are other things like N-linked uh, glycosylation sites, the abundance of the pro uh, gene products, molecular weight, I, I just showed you, and overrepresented uh, uh, gene products. Mm -hmm. So conserved genes are more, uh, more common among uh, uh, nuclear localization, whereas direct genes are in chemokines and receptors, cell and immunity, and so on. So uh, we can clearly see that these two groups of, 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 of genes they have uh, uh, different uh, uh, functions. Of course, these are statistical uh, results, so it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be a, a nuclear protein, for example, among the direct genes, but they are much more common <coughs> among the conserved genes. So, uh, you may ask, what does it matter? What's the meaning in here? One practical uh, issue is that uh, uh, animal models, the directed genes, may not actually be the ideal ones for the, for the, for example, uh, mouse models, because they are having different evol evolutionary past and, and, and different evol evolutionary pressure, so they may not be uh, good human models, and that has actually been seen in some cases. Then I, I, I skip into a completely different thing, but again using uh, information from here, looking at novel primary immunodeficiency candidate genes. Uh, and this was done uh, based on different information. I'll just show that in a minute. Uh, we, we include information about essential genes, and those which are lethal in mouse, embryonic, perinatal, or neonatal lethality in there. We look at the enrichment of the geo terms uh, about the uh, uh, known immunodeficiency genes and network pro uh, properties, including vulnerability, closeness, centrality, and degree. And all of these are highly significantly different between the two groups, all genes and essential genes. So we can use them as, as, as features in here. And uh, when putting the data together, we get this kind of graph where we find 26 novel candidate genes which are involved in signaling. There are some receptors, protein kinases, adapters and binding proteins, and also some enzymes. And uh, this far, at least three of these have been shown to be uh, actually immunodeficiency genes responsible for PIDs. So the method works. Uh, some of those are so central uh, genes that we don't accept them. They are probably lethal, so that they can't be seen in, 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 in PIDs. In the next step, uh, we are looking at the classification of primary immunodeficiencies. There's more than 200 of these. These are the defects, intrinsic defects of the immune system, affecting the immune system. And there's more than 200 of them, and they are uh, widely different. And, and the classification is needed for different purposes, including diagnosis, treatment choice, research purposes, informatics, demographics, and so on. So uh, uh, there's widely variable phenotypes which makes the classification difficult. And there are some, several existing uh, groupings, but since there's more than 200 diseases, it's getting difficult to keep in mind all the, all the things in there. So uh, we made the classification based on signs, symptoms, and laboratory values. In the beginning, we had altogether 400 parameters and 200, about 200 diseases. It's getting multidimensional. Uh, we were uh, 
pruning and cleaning the data and had in the end 85 uh, parameters left, uh, which were for infections, immune system dysregulation, associated diseases, signs and symptoms, and laboratory features. And uh, uh, there are existing classifications from, from uh, diverse sources, different uh, societies have done that, and, and uh, uh, they have been further, further expanded by some others. So what we used in here, uh, we used six uh, classification approaches. Uh, three class clustering methods, k-means clustering based on, on, on uh, three different uh, 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 approaches to look at the distances, clustering of large systems, partitioning around midoids, fuzzy clustering, and three community analysis methods. And then we were looking at the consensus of the system. And this is what we get. So we have uh, about 200 diseases in here, and, and uh, uh, here is the root for PIDs. And when we come in here, four methods agree in here, in this point, there's five methods agreeing, and the boxes, there's six methods ag uh, agreeing on the uh, grouping of the, of the dis uh, diseases. And when we start to look at this, we see that uh, many of these, uh, 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 what we call for disease clusters, they contain, uh, contain uh, genes or, or diseases which have similar functions like uh, uh, severe combined immunodeficiency in here, fever syndromes, complement, and so on. Uh, we could look at uh, what features in our system were actually typical for each of these clusters. And uh, I'm showing to now a number of figures in here uh, to verify this classification on data not used for the, for the classification. Just look at the colors in here. So uh, here we have the severity. Uh, and, and indicated in here with the different colors. And the point is here, many of the, of the uh, disease clusters are having the same color. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so here we were looking at the functional properties. Again, uh, there is differences in the, in the clusters, but there are some clusters which are very homogeneous. When looking at the vulnerability of the, of the networks, again, uh, this is very uh, indicating that the classification is, is, is working. Therapeutic options, the same as in, in here, and also comparison to previous classifications. So, indeed, the classification makes sense. I still have to rush through one part of the talk about uh, the system's immunology. Uh, we have been looking at the B cell development using transcriptomics and proteomics approaches and, and generating this kind of graphs about uh, expressions. So this is about gene expression in time series in Ramos B cells, in this case, and, and here are the different expression patterns of, 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 of the genes. Now the data wasn't, uh, in the end, good enough for, for um, uh, detailed analysis, uh, but we get an idea what's going on in there and about uh, what processes are important. So uh, after a couple of years, we returned to the problem and uh, developed a new kind of approach to look at the central uh, network in, in T-cells. And we started by reconstructing an immunome interactome, this time uh, with uh, gene expression data from uh, Array Express and GEO. And this is how it goes. Uh, in the end, we get the link-weighted immunome interactome, with uh, from normalization and patch effect analysis, jackknife correlation, and so on. And from here, we get uh, the genes. This time, this was expanded from the IKB, because IKB contains only those uh, uh, truly central. Now we have uh, the entire pathways included. So it was more than 1,200 uh, uh, genes in the end. And... Uh, this is just indicating that uh, data is pretty clean, correlation of the gene expression. Uh, we, uh, we utilized the global statistical significance algorithm, GLOSS, in here, uh, which uh, is a, a, a good method for this kind of thing. So, so this is uh, calculating the significance in the, in, the, in the network, and we were taking at each step away the least correlated gene. Uh, this is just indicating what happens in there. 
Uh, in the end, we have a network. The red ones here indicate essential genes. Those which in mouse are lethal. And then we compare the, uh, our, our network to the uh, random uh, link weight uh, randomized network, which is here, uh, this one. And the, and the red one is our TPP ion, which means the T cell protein protein interaction network. We see that uh, even when we go on in the, our, our system, we already use the number and number. The, the network makes sense, whereas the random, when deleting uh, nodes randomly, uh, destroys the entire system. So we end up in here. Okay, the red ones are the genes that uh, and proteins which we found to be essential for T cells, just based on the gene expression. Then we put this into the known um, uh, pathways, signaling pathways. We have here PI3, AKT signaling pathway, NF kappa B pathway, JAKSTAT, and so on. And we see that uh, actually uh, many of these pathways, they are fully coming out from here without any information about their protein-protein interactions or relevance to the networks. Uh, the idea of this exercise is to um, combine information for next step for simulation and modeling of these pathways. I don't have results yet. They are coming. But that's my story. So what I was discussing today was how to define immunome, what it what it is, what it includes, uh, and then what we can do with the immunome, what, what kind of properties the immunome uh, genes and proteins have, how the evolution has been during the time. Interactome, we found that the efficiency and vulnerability of the network are actually going against uh, the normal paradigm. Uh, and. Uh, when looking at the animal models, you should be aware of uh, which kind of uh, evolution there is, there is affecting that, that gene, whether it's, uh, uh, it can be used as a model for human genes or not. We were looking for candidate genes, provide a, a new classification for primary immunodeficiencies. It is a good classification, but it hasn't been adopted by the community. And finally, uh, about the uh, initial steps of systems immunology, which we are now going further to investigate. Thank you for your attention. What I tried to do today, uh, and what we've been doing for the last uh, 10 years, at least in the part of the work in my lab, is to look at large-scale data uh, more from a statistical point of view than to pinpoint specific mutations or specific uh, proteins. And what I'm going to try to convince you today is that the epitopes that we see in viruses are far from being random. They're very biased towards specific proteins, towards uh, specific viruses even. Uh, and the fact that they're not biased, the fact that they're not random should affect the way we try to treat viruses and the true way we try uh, to do vaccines. Now, uh, how do I do that? No, that's probably the wrong way to do. Uh, so uh, the, the tool we're going to use for that is a score that we've been using for the last seven, eight years, which we call the SIR score, the SIR score. And, and the score represents basically the ratio between the number of epitopes you observe in a given uh, protein and the number of epitopes you would expect to observe, assuming that the protein would behave randomly. Now, what's random, uh, that's not easy to define, but basically we could define randomly in two ways. Either scrambling the order of the amino acids uh, in the protein, or just producing a random uh, protein from the amino acid composition of a given organism. And to do that, we use a combination, uh, do, do we have a pointer? No. You have one. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, to do that, we use a combination of uh, multiple uh, machine learning algorithms to predict all the stages of presentation of epitopes. So suppose we take proteins from a given virus. We can predict which proteins are cut. 
through the proteasome, and then which are transferred to the ER through TAPS, and then which bind different MHC class 1 uh, molecules and compute uh, the number of proteins we predict to be expressed, for, number of epitopes we predict to be expressed from a given protein in a given virus. Now, the trouble with that is that there are a lot of MHC class 1 alleles. I mean, we have recently published a few weeks ago an updated estimate of the number of MHC class 1 alleles in different populations in the U.S., and the number varies uh, between a few thousands in the Caucasian populations and a few hundreds in the Afro-American populations for uh, allele class uh, 1 A and B, slightly lower for DQB, DQDR, and DRBX. But still, there are many different alleles of class 1. So practically every single person in this class has a different class 1 a little combination than anyone else. So if you want to say how many epitopes are presented uh, from a given protein in a given virus, that's very specific to each one of you. Each one presents very different epitopes. But what we can ask is suppose we take a population. Uh, most of you are Caucasians, just making a generic analysis on the audience. So suppose we would take the Caucasian population and ask within this population, how many epitopes in average are presented by a given protein in a virus? So we would get a number, and then we would make the same analysis on the scrambled sequence of the same protein, and we would get another number. And then we would define the score, which would be the ratio of these two numbers. Obviously, this score is population dependent, because if you would go to another population, then people would have different uh, MHC class 1 proteins, and they would express different epitopes. So we have a score which is actually population uh, sensitive. Most of what I'll show you will be in the Caucasian population, because that's where we have most data, except for some viruses where we actually focus on the local population where the virus is expressed. So uh, taking this SIR score, so everything being random, the number of presented epitopes should be the expected number of presented epitopes. So everything being random, this score should be just one, or distributed uh, around one. Unfortunately, things are not random. Unfortunately, uh, viruses present less epitopes than you would expect them to present. And the reason they express less epitopes than you would expect them to present is because they specifically mutate epitope to avoid being detected by the immune response. That's the game of viruses. They don't want us to kill them from their point of view, with the bad guys. So they mutate their epitopes to avoid being killed by uh, the immune response. Uh, so, for example, if you would take all human viruses on the Caucasian population, the average SIR score is around 0 0.85. So it's less than one. Just as a validation, if you would take non-human uh, viruses, then the SIR score is around one, because they don't infect humans. So when you look at human, specifically Caucasian uh, populations, then viruses never accumulated escape mutations for these specific alleles. Now, uh, that's actually a sad graph, because it means that in the coevolution of humans and viruses, then viruses win, because they manage to accumulate mutations, while we do not manage to actually adapt our MHC system to present as many epitopes as we can uh, from these viruses. Note that there is a glimpse of hope. You see this small bump here? That's just a glimpse of hope. That's two viruses. Uh, so I know at least one of you in the audience heard the, uh, the talk before, so you're not allowed to answer. But for those of you that never heard the talk, what's a guess on what this blimp here? What? No. So what blimp, what on earth did the Caucasian population adapt this MHC distribution to? Smallpox. Obviously, there is one virus that shaped you all, and it's here. So you were all adapted to better respond to smallpox. Those that are not adapted are not here anymore. So they're not in our distribution. Uh, so, j just to take an example of the evolution of viruses, 
In this case, the evolution is, uh, is mainly uh, studied on a sub-Saharan African populations. So let's take HIV-2 or HIV-1 and let's compare the number of epitopes SIV had just before it adapted to the human population. So we see a drop of almost 20% in the epitopes over the population in the adaptation of SIV to HIV. So when SIV was in monkey, it had many epitopes. It came to the humans, 20% of them are gone. It managed actually to remove a big part of what it presents as the immune response quite fast. However, it gets more interesting than that. Because, uh, well, you know, HIV has a life cycle. So uh, when it gets into a host cell, first it expresses statin rep, then it expresses VPR, VIF, and VPU, then it expresses NEF, PULV, and VENGAG. So there is a life cycle. When you get first, you express your regulatory proteins, and then you start producing all the machinery of the virus. Now you can ask, okay, so suppose you are a virus, and suppose you are attacked by CD8 sisters that are deadly, they kill within minutes. Now where on earth would you try most to remove your epitopes? Obviously on the ones expressed for a long time. Because if they're expressed for a long time, you actually are a sitting target for CD8 T-cells to kill you. So suppose I was HIV, what I would do is to remove practically all epitopes from TAT and REV, and then from VPR, VIF, and VPU, and only then care about NEF, PULP, and NGAG, because once I express those, it's too late. I can bad. I can already leave the cell, and from my point of view, the host can kill the cell, because I don't care anymore. I'm already ready to attack the next host. Now that's precisely what uh, HIV does. So that's the ratio between the expected and observed number, the observed and expected number of epitopes, TAS, VPR, and REV are very few, and as you go and increase all the way through the life cycle of HIV, it simply increases. So not only do they remove epitopes, they do it in a very, very smart way. They actually optimize the price they're willing to remove epitopes compared to the price they actually lose from being detected by the immune response. Now, to, to verify that, this was an average over the sub-Saharan African populations. To check that more precisely, we went to hosts that are actually typed. So we went to hosts that are typed, and viruses which are sequenced from this host. And when you look at this host, and when you look on the specific haplo, uh, HLA haplotype of this specific host, then TAT and REV have actually removed all epitopes. They're, you're blind to them. So the host doesn't see them anymore. Because uh, it's so crucial for HIV to remove them that it's willing to do any possible effort on Earth to remove epitopes not to sit for 20 or for 48 hours presenting epitopes to the immune system to be killed uh, by the immune systems. However, when you look at the gag at the end, then it practically didn't change. It practically didn't remove any single epitopes. It's as if HIV tells you, you know what, you can target gag. I don't know, I don't care. I mean, once you target gag, I'm already gone. I'm already ready to infect another cell. Now, this could have been a story uh, about just uh, HIV, right? And uh, if you look on the evolution of HIV, it actually accumulates, uh, so it, uh, when it m moved from HIV to, H to HIV, it actually accumulated epitopes in gag. It actually didn't care at all to have more epitopes in gag. Now, the problem with vaccine to HIV is that most of them focus on gag. Most of them focused on the protein that the virus clearly tell you, well, I don't care if you'll attack it. Because once you attack it, it's way too late for you. Now, you can read the same story. The same story that happens in hepatitis virus. The same story happens in herpes virus. They all remove epitopes. Uh, I've shown you the story about HIV. And they all remove epitopes on early proteins, but never on late proteins. So, for example, uh, that... Uh, the uh, ratio, or, or uh, the difference, sorry, between the SAR score in late protein and in early protein in uh, something like 40 or 50 different human viruses and 31 very frequent HLA alleles, a positive number means that you have more epitopes in late uh, proteins and the negative value means that you have less epitopes in late proteins. 
So in practically all virus tested, and in practically all HLA alleles tested, viruses make the effort to remove epitopes only in early proteins. Because once they express the late structural protein that they need to get out of the cell, then it's too late for you. I mean, they've already won this round, and they're ready to infect the next cell. If they maintain epitope on an early protein, then the host won. Because uh, it can kill the infected cell early enough, and then the virus cannot bat and infect another cell. So next time you're designing a vaccine, try to attack early. That, that's a general rule in life, actually. Uh, now, actually, uh, herpes shows an even more interesting, because some herpes proteins have late, some herpes viruses have latent proteins. Uh, that's, for example, uh, MHV68, that's using mouse MHC uh, molecules. Uh, but uh, you can look at uh, uh, HSV1, CMV, KSHV, and EBV, same thing. Latent proteins have the lower number of epitopes. Why do they have the lower number of epitopes? Because latent proteins are even worse than early expressed proteins. They're not expressed for 24 to 48 hours. They're expressed for months and years. So in this case, the mouse is a sitting duck. I mean, not the mouse, sorry, the virus is a sitting duck. So you can kill him, and he has nowhere to escape because he's latent. Now, how about bacteria? So, uh, well, you would say, well, bacteria don't care about MHC class 1 because bacteria do not live in the cytosol. So they don't express proteins that can be moved to uh, MHC class 1, so they shouldn't care about uh, T cells or CD8 T cells killing them. So you would argue that bacteria have precisely the same number of epitopes as you would expect. So you see in a gray, well, they're both gray, actually. So, well, I would say a light gray and a dark gray. Uh, so you see in light gray uh, the expected distribution. You see in dark gray the observed distribution. And that's the same. Which seems to be a very boring slide, except that it's not. Because uh, actually bacteria do express some proteins on MHC class 1. Because many bacteria have effectors that are actually transferred to the cytosols of uh, their target cell. So, for example, you could take E. coli. E. coli has actually a set of effectors. It's infecting its target cell before it's starting to use it. And epitopes in E. coli are not removed in average. But epitopes in effectors of E. coli are mutated at a level that they've lost something like 20% uh, of their epitopes over the population. Note that it's an average of the population in a single host. It can be way less than that. So you may say, well, that's just E. coli, but you can look at Shigella, uh, which has effectors that are transferred to the cytosol, and it's the same thing, especially in early effectors. If Shigella is presenting cells, is presenting proteins on the MHC molecule of its, target, of its host cell, then it doesn't want its host cell to be killed. So it's actually removing epitopes from these early effectors. The same so thing go for Pseudomonas, but then we had a surprise. Uh, so whenever we tested bacteria presenting epitopes to the immune system, bacteria mutate their epitopes. Bacteria in this context behave just like viruses. They don't want their target cell to be detected and killed because they use the target cell for themselves. So they want to maintain the target cell alive so that they can use it as much as they can. The only and single exception we found to that, and we studied tens of different bacteria and hundreds of different proteins, the only and single exception is this specific protein, which you probably never heard of. It's called EXO-U. It's a Pseudomonas effector. And that's actually presenting way more epitopes than, uh, than what you would expect. So we wrote in a footnote or note on the paper that uh, we have one exception, and then we had a reviewer which was actually, uh, I wouldn't say, well, smart enough to push us to find uh, why do we have this exception. So we started digging, and exo-U is the only effector in Pseudomonas 
that has a single role, which is to induce apoptosis in the target cell. So, EXO-U is actually the only effector on Earth that role is not to maintain the host cell so that the bacteria can use it, but its role is actually to kill the host cell. Now, there is no easier way to kill a host cell than to present epitopes on top of MHC class 1 molecules. Then, the host will do the work for you. You don't even need to do the apoptosis. The host will kill the cell for you. Now, we can go on to different uh, bacterial proteins. And just to show you, it's not only the total number of epitopes, but the quality of epitopes. So, uh, bacteria uh, remove, uh, reduce the probability of cleavage by the proteasome of their epitope. They remove, reduce the average MSC class binding score. They reduce the top probability, the top transfer probability to the ER. So, altogether, bacteria work as hard as viruses to remove the epitopes they present to the immune system. Uh, and that's some other bacteria, if you're not, I mean, if you're not tired of seeing bacteria removing epitopes. Uh, the story of protuberculosis is, uh, uh, is, is really interesting, because interesting, uh, there is an ESAT 6 family of effectors that are presented to the cytosol, and as you can see, as was the case everywhere, effectors have way, way less epitopes than you would expect, while random proteins are precisely uh, what you would expect. Now, the interesting story about that is that there is a big family of ESAT6, and some of them are cytosolic, while others are not. So, let, let me just reiterate uh, what I've said up now. Only proteins present in the cytosol of cells reach at a high level MHC class 1 molecules. So, that's the only proteins viruses and bacteria care about. Now, uh, there was this family of ESAT6 uh, proteins, but only a few of them are presented in the uh, cytosol. So, uh, in this paper, we divided all proteins in this family to those that have a low level of epitopes and those that have a high level of epitopes and argue that only those with a low level of epitopes are cytosolic. And a few years later, actually our guess was almost perfectly precise. I mean, practically all the ones we predicted to be cytosolic were cytosolic, while all the ones we predicted not to be cytosolic were not cytosolic. So, uh, the game is very easy, and there is only one winner, and that's the pathogens. So, when they get to a host, they remove their epitopes, and we can't discover them, and they only care to remove epitopes, uh, which they care for, which are those that are expressed on MHC class 1 molecules and expressed uh, early enough. Um, but there is an interesting story. Suppose you would have two overlapping proteins. So, I don't know if you know, but viruses have overlapping reading frames. So, you can have two proteins using the same genetic material. I mean, they're just one on top of the other. But then, if I have these two proteins, and I do a mutation in this one, then this one will acquire a mutation too. Now, it's not the virus playing against us, it's the virus playing against itself. Now the question who's going to win. So we have two proteins, uh, both expressed simultaneously. When you do a mutation here, you also affect here. So when you want to remove an epitope here, you can affect the other protein. So where would you remove the epitope? I mean, suppose you were a virus, what would you do? Obviously, you would remove the epitope where it hurts you most. So, uh, an interesting story for that, for that is HPV. HPV has its polymerase overlapping all its other uh, proteins. Uh, but, the polymerase is expressed 2,000 times less than any other protein. So, it's expressing way, way less copy numbers than other proteins. Then, if you express polymerase, you don't care. Because the chance that you'll get killed by the immune system by expressing an epitope on polymerase is very low. But the chance that you'll be killed by the immune system by expressing an epitope on surface or core X, which are expressed to, at way higher levels than polymerase, is very high. So what would you expect to do? You would remove epitopes on those even if you accumulate epitopes on polymerase. That's precisely 
what uh, HPV does. It actually accumulates epitopes on polymerase and actually reduces epitopes on all other proteins. So, uh, well, I skip that and I'll go here. So, uh, just to summarize where we stand now, because I see him looking at his clock, so I start throwing. Uh, so, just to summarize what we've learned up to now. What we've learned up to now is that uh, viruses are adapting very fast. Bacteria are doing the same. But they're pinpointing their mutations. So not accumulating the mutation all around. So they're accumulating escape mutations. They're accumulating mutations that hide their epitopes only where it's important. Only if the protein is expressed for a long enough time. Or only when the, like, the protein is expressed for at a very high copy number. Now what would that do to the genetic composition of viruses? So uh, here comes another level of evolution. Uh, once a virus moves from, say, me to, I don't want to point any of you, so someone else, uh, then it has to encounter a new set of MHC molecules. Now, all the hard work he has done when he was in a given host to remove epitopes will be lost when he's moving to another host because the other host has different MHC molecules. So what he will have to do, he will have to mutate again to adapt to the other host. And then going again, he will have to mutate again. Now, playing this game of mutating over and over again has a price. First, you can mutate to a stop cotton, which is uh, not really nice because you're going to die. Uh, and also, uh, you want uh, to be able to mutate with a, slow, a low number of uh, mutations. So to test that, what we did is uh, we looked at the codon composition of all viruses that we have analyzed, which are quite a lot, I mean, a few hundred, uh, and we check whether uh, epitopes have more changeable codons. So say, to, I don't know, take for example, arginine, uh, well, I can see here. Uh, or, or any here. Uh, it has different codons. Some of them are easy to change. So some of them will mutate to a different amino acid with a single nucleotide mutation, while some uh, would cost you two mutations to move to a different amino acid. What you get is that epitopes use more changeable codons for the same amino acid than non-epitopes. So that's the relative frequency of a codon in epitopes compared to non-epitopes, and that's how changeable it is. So epitopes use more changeable uh, uh, codons, and they also use codons which are farther away from stop codons because they don't want to mutate to a stop codon. So actually viruses not only learn to escape, they have adapted their entire genetic code to escape epitopes. So since I have only five uh, more minutes, um, I'll just talk about two uh, more interesting uh, stories. One interesting story is uh, the cost of uh, evolution. So uh, there is an, a very old argument, actually raised by Fisher already, that when you're too big, you can't evolve. You've actually shown that in one of your figures. Uh, so you've shown the molecular weight of um, proteins that evolve compared to proteins that don't evolve. Proteins that evolve have a low molecular weight. They have a shorter sequence. It's easier for them to evolve. Proteins which are too big cannot evolve. It's too complicated to evolve. I mean, you have to conserve something too big. So uh, that uh, correlation between the SI, that the SIR score, which is the number of proteins, you can actually clearly see that when you're big, the SIR score is around one, and when you're small, it's actually decreasing quite fast. So only small viruses adapt, because when they're too big, they cannot adapt. But that works actually uh, at even at the the single protein level. So long proteins uh, adapt way less than short proteins. Long proteins, so there is a positive correlation between the number of epitopes and the length of the protein. There are practically no uh, viral proteins in our analysis that have a negative correlation. Most of them have a positive correlation. So the longer they have, the more epitopes they have compared to what you would expect. So the longer they are, the less, the less they adapt. That's a kind of a generic rule in life. I skip all of that too. Uh, so, uh, 
I've given you a broad overview of how uh, uh, epitopes, uh, how uh, viral epitopes evolve, and uh, what you can learn from the distribution uh, of epitopes. Uh, now, uh, I just want to give you a very short overview of what you can do with that. So, just a few examples. Uh, that's an interesting example. We're working uh, with a big transplantation center, and they have a question. Uh, suppose we have two donors uh, with the same mismatch. So they all have one. So you know, when you have to give a blood transplantation, you would like to have no mismatch between the donor and the one that receives the blood transplantation. Unfortunately, most of the transplantation have at least one mismatch. So the question is, who would you prefer among donors with the same mismatch? So we ask, uh, is there a correlation between the survival and the distance or the difference between the epitope repertoire. And what you can see here is that both in A and B epitopes, there is a clear negative correlation uh, between distance and survival. So if you transplant MHC molecule with two different ep uh, epitope repertoire, the survival probability decreases. I mean, even if you have a mismatch, you may want to transplant somebody which is very similar to you in the epitope repertoire than somebody which is different from you in the epitope repertoire. So that's one nice application in the context of transplantation. Uh, we're hoping soon to have that actually applied in a transplantation protocol. Uh, the other application, uh, which may be for you, Vladimir, is uh, vaccine design. So I've just convinced you that uh, it's better to target uh, viral proteins that the virus wants to hide. So that may actually guide us in vaccine design. So since the virus can mutate uh, so fast, then, uh, and I'll skip because I, I So uh, what we would like to do actually is not to target a specific epitope, but to have a combination of epitopes, a large combination of epitopes, composed of epitopes to proteins that the virus actually tries to mutate. Because those are the proteins that one you would target would harm the virus. Now, obviously, you cannot have one epitope because the virus would mutate away. But if you have a large enough combination that are optimally positioned to be cut and produce an optimal immune response, you may be able to cover the entire surrounding of the virus in the proteins where he, he wants to hide, but he won't be able to do that, and then you'll be able to kill the virus early enough. So that's, that's uh, yeah. So that's a general overview of what we can do with uh, viral epitope repertoire and uh, how we can adapt that to actually do vaccines or do better uh, transplantation uh, policies. Uh, now, all I've presented you today was done by other people, unfortunately, uh, not by me. Those are my students uh, that did all this really interesting work. Those are collaborators uh, in uh, doing uh, most of the work, and those are the funding agency. And thanks to organizers for the invitation. It's really fun. Thank you for listening. Dear chairmen and uh, colleagues, uh, first of all, I would like to express uh, my thanks uh, to organize the committee for inviting our group on this conference. Uh, it's a very interesting topic in progress now. And uh, in Minsk, we are working in the field of allergy and uh, <coughs> infectious diseases. And uh, <coughs> Switch. First thing? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Immune system is very important for development of uh, allergic diseases and infectious diseases also. But mechanism developing of uh, allergic diseases and uh, immune response, protective immune response, 
against uh, different uh, infectious agents like viruses or bacteria, parasites, that's different. It's very important to understand how to work genes of immune system in different uh, etiological agents. And uh, from this point of view, <coughs> we are pay attention to classical two mechanisms of antibody affinity maturation. It is uh, the first uh, somatic recombination, for which uh, drive by uh, enzymes RAG1 and RAG2, and also somatic hyper hypermutation in mechanism which uh, drive of repertoire of uh, antibodies and affinity maturation. And uh, from uh, mm, Recombination process and hypermutation, somatic hypermutation, we have a different level of antibodies with a different uh, capacity for binding with uh, epitopes of uh, different uh, antigens. And uh, besides uh, uh, two enzymes like RAG1 and RAG2, uh, there are also many different enzymes which uh, take part in uh, uh, somatic hypermutation and also in uh, class switching, to, it means in recombination. Uh, the main of these uh, uh, enzymes, uh, this cytidine DMNA activated uh, enzyme. <coughs> and uh, this uh, uh, enzyme take part in different uh, biological processes uh, and uh, expressed in uh, intracellular forms and also uh, play a role in DNA reparation, epi epigenetic regulation and uh, somatic hypermutation. And also uh, part of this uh, Enzyme which are uh, intracellular form, they uh, influence on uh, degradation on uh, free nucleotides and uh, metabolism of uh, amino acids and uh, produce uh, antiviral activity. This uh, protein, uh, family of all this protein, uh, very conservative, uh, but uh, in uh, catalytic uh, domain there is a thin containing uh, center which uh, very conserved, but some mutations in this uh, center uh, uh, happened with loss of uh, uh, activity in uh, somatic hypermutation. And uh, this uh, enzyme working together with uh, uh, different and other uh, enzymes and polymerases which uh, take part in uh, processes of transitions like CV to CA and transversion CG to GC and also mutation AC and GC it means this uh, different uh, uh, kind of mutation which uh, happened uh, uh, with uh, changes of nucleotides in uh, different uh, codon of genes immunoglobulins. And the uh, aim uh, of this uh, research was to evaluate frequency of immunoglobulin genes families using for antibody formation in patients with allergic diseases and hepatitis C and HIV viral infection. And the next was characterizing nucleotide substitution in IgE genes of patients with allergic diseases and IgG genes patients with hepatitis C, hepatitis C plus lymphomas and hepatitis C plus cryoglobulinemia. <coughs> Investigate clonality of VDJ hypervariable region immunoglobulin genes in healthy people and uh, patients with viral infections. And also we investigate activity ICID in uh, and uh, uh, adenosine DMNAs in serum of patients with acute and chronical viral infection. 
Uh, we used as material for investigation sequences from uh, NSB genes uh, patients with uh, allergy and viral infections, totally around uh, 100, uh, 1,300 fragments of V genes, uh, and uh, also DNA lymphocytes and serum of uh, healthy people and patients. Uh, for detection of activity uh, cited in DMNAs and adenine DMNAs. We used uh, some methods uh, for bioinformatics and also the PCR for um, amplification uh, of uh, VDJ genes uh, and biochemical determination uh, these enzymes in the serum of patients. It's some simple statistical analysis. Uh, um, first uh, part of this uh, report is uh, um, evaluation frequency of families of immun immunoglobulin genes in patients with allergic diseases. As you can see from uh, this uh, uh, table, uh, it's possible <coughs> there are mostly seven families of genes which used, uh, which found in uh, patients with uh, different allergic diseases. And we used group uh, donors, uh, non-itopic donors, and uh, patients with allergic diseases, uh, bronchi asthma, and atopic dermatitis. Uh, as you can see that uh, uh, this uh, family of genes not equal represented between this group of patients. Uh, more frequency used uh, uh, genes uh, said and force family of genes, but uh, some genes like uh, uh, seventh family genes very seldom used, and uh, the said family genes also very uh, seldom used. Uh, uh, more often uh, uh, fifth family of these genes. It's uh, not understandable. Uh, probably this difference uh, reflects uh, um, course of disease and the main mechanisms of uh, formation of these diseases because they uh, are clinically very different. And also we analyze uh, nucleotide substitution, GC to AT and GC CG in variable regions of uh, immu immunoglobulin genes. And you can see from this picture that uh, difference in ratio of GC AT and uh, GC CG was significant high in the uh, people non-atopic. Uh, family of gene, uh, said family of gene, and uh, in atopic uh, rhinitis, uh, family of gene 4 and 5. With this prodominance transition, GC to AT and reflects decreased activity enzyme RIV1. Uh, family of genes uh, first, second, third, five, fifth and fourth uh, in bronchi asthma patients uh, and uh, variable regions, uh, fifth and fourth gene family from patients with atopic uh, dermatitis, characterized also with decreased activity of this enzyme, uh, of these significant changes ratio of GC to AT and uh, GC CG and the predominance of uh, transition so GC AT. Uh, if we look at uh, nucleotide substitution GCAC to ATGC in variable regions, uh, genes, uh, uh, we can uh, find, find that the difference changes GCAC and ATGC was not significant in the variable regions. Uh, uh, in people uh, non-atopic uh, and uh, patients with uh, atopic rhinitis, including the high activity, uh, indicating of high activity of uh, po polymerase nu. Uh, 
Fifth uh, and uh, fourth gene family uh, from uh, atopic dermatitis and bronchi asthma patients characterized uh, decreased activity polymerase nu, which uh, with domination transition uh, GC, AC, OAC to GC. Uh, the set family uh, genes in bronchi asthma patients most frequently used and characterized by predominance of substitution ATGC over transition GC and AT indicating sufficient activity of repair mechanisms. Analyzing uh, frequency using of uh, family of uh, Uh, genes uh, in patients with uh, chronic uh, hepatitis C infection, we can see that uh, there are more, more uh, no small proportion of these genes which used uh, in this uh, infection. It means that uh, only family fifth and uh, Uh, third and fourth family and the uh, uh, first family of genes and the fourth family of genes dominated in patients with hepatitis C and then mostly of them you see it is uh, family uh, the first family around the 60% of uh, population of these genes Uh, and uh, family genes uh, of this, uh, in patients with hepatitis C and cryovolinemia. The second type uh, uh, we found that uh, was used uh, uh, five families of these genes uh, with uh, predominance of uh, third family and the first family of uh, uh, genes in these patients uh, means uh, more wide spectrum of uh, genes was used uh, for uh, forming of uh, antibodies. And uh, in group of patients with hepatitis C uh, and lymphomas, we found four family of genes which used for antibody formation uh, with uh, predominance uh, also uh, the third and fourth family of genes. Uh, In uh, HIV infected patients and patients with HIV associated lymphomas, uh, is evidence that a uh, lack of reliable difference between the transitions GCAT and replace of AT GC. And the uh, uh, ratio of transitions uh, GCAT to transversion GC CG listing the sequences of immunoglobulin genes of uh, uh, HCV infected patients and fragments of immunoglobulin genes in patients with uh, HCV associated to this uh, cryoglobulinemia and uh, HCV related lymphomas characterized by the ratio of rate increase GCAT to GCCG So, in this uh, picture, uh, associated uh, ICV infection with cryoglobulinemia and lymphomas, they uh, cause uh, by IT mutation pressure. And the next part of uh, report is uh, uh, to address to um, activated induced uh, cytidine diseminase uh, and uh, adenine diseminase uh, detection and uh, using uh, special primers uh, by PCR reaction uh, we detect uh, uh, fragments uh, from uh, around 300 uh, bases uh, uh, to 400 bases which uh, Uh, reflect uh, VDJ uh, rearrangement uh, product uh, and uh, in the next uh, picture uh, in 26 from 26 samples 
to we found two uh, samples uh, from healthy volunteers which had electrophoretic features uh, of clonality. In this uh, picture you can see this uh, bands uh, which uh, showed this evidence. Uh, and uh, also uh, we uh, did, did an investigation uh, for development of uh, methodology evaluation of uh, uh, cytidine DMNAs uh, in fluids like serums uh, or plasma and uh, used uh, for that uh, uh, phenol nitroproceed uh, uh, methods and uh, we applied uh, this uh, protocol to colorimetric uh, investigation uh, in uh, planchets uh, and uh, uh, investigate uh, activity of uh, cytidine DMNAs uh, in the serum different uh, patients, patients with different infections like uh, uh, chronic hepatitis C uh, HIV infection, uh, herpetic uh, virus 6 types, and Epstein-Barr virus infection, and uh, people with uh, post-influenza pneumonia, and in control group. As you can see from this uh, uh, figure, uh, most uh, um, increased activity of this enzyme was in patients with uh, post-influenza pneumonia and uh, Epstein-Barr virus infection, but uh, was decreased significantly in patients with HIV infection and uh, uh, hepatitis C and uh, herpetic virus infection 6 type. It means that uh, probably some of these uh, <coughs> viruses uh, as intracellular uh, pathogens, uh, they, uh, in the, their life cycle, produce some uh, proteins, small proteins, uh, which are uh, able to regulate uh, gene expression of this enzyme, and uh, in the totally they able to influence uh, on uh, processes of class immunoglobulin switching and also uh, on uh, somatic recombination. Uh, we modify uh, these uh, uh, methods and uh, used uh, instead of uh, cytidine as substrate uh, uh, gem cytabine. This uh, structure of this molecule is very similar and uh, this uh, gives for us a uh, uh, more standardized substrate which is uh, useful for laboratory investigation and the uh, comparison of these results uh, showed us very high level of correlation between traditional uh, investigation and uh, uh, investigation using by this new substrate. And uh, also uh, the second enzyme which we uh, also pay attention it is uh, adenosine DMNAs. <coughs> this methodology detection activity of this uh, enzyme is very similar to cytidine induced uh, DMNAs uh, and uh, uh, used uh, the same approaches. Uh, uh, this uh, enzyme uh, has many, many functions and also play a role in uh, somatic hypermutation and glass switching and the uh, regulation function of uh, CD4 cells uh, uh, and uh, uh, the main function is uh, the amines of adenosine uh, because if adenosine will not metabolize, this will be uh, inhibit uh, reaction of uh, T cells. Uh, and uh, we found uh, in the different patients, uh, patients with Epstein-Barr infections, 
a high level, uh, very increased level of this enzyme, and decreased uh, uh, activity in the patients with uh, uh, herpetic virus 6 type infection and uh, in hepatitis C, but uh, slightly increased uh, in patients with HIV infection. Uh, uh, last year we produced a special kit for determination of this enzyme. You can see on this uh, slide this kit, uh, and we received uh, approval from Minister of Public, uh, Public Health. And uh, now we start to sail in uh, Belarus uh, and uh, abroad. Uh, the next uh, step uh, and the next line of our research, uh, it is uh, in the uh, area of genomics, is uh, uh, using application of uh, microarray technology for evaluation gene expression and different uh, pathological uh, conditions, uh, infections, auto autoimmunity, I'm finishing now, uh, autoimmunity, uh, now this from left is picture from uh, patients uh, with psoriasis, uh, uh, heat uh, diagram uh, controls and patients, and also we, we try to use uh, clusterization for differentiation of patients uh, depends uh, from uh, level of uh, gene expression. Mostly of these genes we demonstrated the uh, uh, reflex of functioning immune system. It's many receptors, cytokines, uh, interferons, interleukins, uh, and uh, uh, hemokines, uh, receptors of hemokines, uh, <coughs> and this profile of gene expression is uh, very useful uh, for clustering of uh, disease depends from activity and probably from uh, genotype of this person which uh, suffered from uh, this uh, very severe uh, pathology. And also a very interesting uh, line now is how, uh, how uh, affect uh, gene expression and uh, uh, also, uh, recombination of uh, uh, class uh, switching and uh, <coughs> somatic hypermutation by microRNA. MicroRNA uh, is very important, and some of them uh, related to B cells, some of them to subpopulation T cells, and uh, neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages. And so now we are looking. Uh, patients and also doing in experiments with uh, isolated uh, different uh, subsets of uh, immune system like dendritic cells, T cells and so on. Here is my research team. Kirill uh, Pavlov presented uh, here and also Olga Yanovich, Stalirova, who uh, did uh, um, bioinformatics investigation. Here is a picture from Minsk. Welcome to Minsk. Thank you very much. Questions? So I take the opportunity and ask. Yeah. Okay. So uh, going back to the high talk, you're trying to do biomarkers for diseases. Yeah. So you're showing the difference in VH usage and uh, in domination. So how wide is the distribution within one disease compared to the health system? I mean, is it precise enough to be used as a biomarker? Because, you know, it's a very interesting question. When we're planning this research, we don't know how genes, a family of genes, distributed between different diseases. It will be equal, using equal genes, like proportion, 10, 20 percent or more, but uh, as you can see, some, some family of genes not used, and some in high prevalence. I, I hope it does need more deeper investigation. Uh, probably uh, we don't know some mechanism which able to choose from bibliotheque of genes. 
uh, which mm-hmm. need for uh, protection or a development of pathology in uh, some patients. But it is an uh, individual bibliotech genes. It's uh, very important. It's like personalized uh, medicine. Uh, yeah. I have a question about uh, the CGAT variations. Yeah. And uh, if you look at what's happening on the protein level, what, what uh, are the Yeah, uh, um, we have uh, such results. Uh, uh, we also determined of uh, uh, hydrophobicity and acrophilicity of uh, uh, amino acids, and we found uh, the strong difference uh, in uh, depends from this uh, pressure changes of nucleotides, uh, but I have not used uh, these slides in my report now, but uh, we will look at, it's very interesting why, uh, because if we have uh, changes nucleotides in codons in the first, second or third position, it means there uh, uh, will be some changes in amino acids, and uh, these amino acids will be uh, depends function of these uh, fragments of heavy change of immunoglobulins. And means that the uh, capacity of these uh, immunoglobulins uh, uh, will be different. Capacity to bind with uh, uh, like allergens or viral proteins like surface IgE, uh, ne- IgE but uh, E2 protein uh, which are receptors for cells uh, of human uh, body. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, honestly. I don't have the, the chance to get invited to many conferences, so I want to, to thank the organizer for inviting me. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, but basically, today I'm going to show you a very simple work, but I think that is also quite interesting, at least from my point of view. The title of the talk is This Arepito Distribution in Viruses is Linked to Protein Biosynthesis and Defines a System to Prioritize Antigens. Maybe I'm going to get, you know, some problem on my neck, I hope not. Just looking. <laughs> yes, yeah, Okay, so I can, I can look at that. So that's great. So this is a great solution. So actually, you know, what we were trained in, in this talk was to find a system to prioritize antigens, you know. But in the process, we find something that uh, I believe is quite interesting. So, but let's begin, you know, by the first slide, which makes sense, you know, to start with the first slide, to say that of all t cell epitopes, I will be talking only about CD8 T cell epitopes. Okay, so anything or everything that I'm, I'm going to be talking is about CD8 T cell epitope. As you know, CD8 T cell epitope are peptides presented by MHC molecule, HLA1 in humans, and they are recognized by the TCR or the CD8 T cells. Okay, so the, that's why they are called CD8 T cell epitopes. Most of the peptides, just to remember you or to remind you how it works in the system, most of the peptides presented by MHC molecule derive from proteins that are intra, intra, that are cytosolic or intracellular and are degraded pro, by the proteasome. So the proteasome generates some peptides and those peptides get into the ER where they get loaded onto, onto the MHC molecule and then they get presented and they get recognized. As you know also, during this brief uh, in brief introduction, the CD8 T cell epitopes are capable of infecting T cell, of infecting infected cells, like you know, cells that, that have been infected by virus, and they can also kill tumor tumor cells. Okay, so basically, I want to I want to bring you to the point that identifying the T cell epitopes, which are also called cytotoxic T lymphocyte epitope, okay, because CD8 T cell epitope. CD8 cells have the ability to kill, this, to kill <laughs> infected cells. So to identify this, this epitope is very important to design a new type of vaccine. Okay? Vaccines that are based on epitopes. And, uh, well, this is basically the business that I've been working on the, on the past year. It is not easy to find those epitopes, actually, to identify this T cell epitope, because it is actually like finding a 
needle in a haystack, you know, and to find that needle in the haystack, so basically what we and others have developed is tools that models each of the steps that determine the immunogenicity of CD80 cell epitope. So these steps are the cleavage by the proteasome, the transport to the ER by, by TAP, peptide, the peptide binding to MHC molecule, and also the recognition by the TCR. I have to say that of all these steps, the most important to predict T cell epitopes if it is binding to MSC molecule. And this is because the binding to the MSC molecule is the most selective step. Okay, so this is the basis actually to predict T cell epitopes. Now you may ask how good, how good are these tools? Well, if you check them computationally, they are simply great. So they do really good, and you can predict the T cell epitopes very well. But experimentally, we have, you know, a somewhat different picture. And this is when, what I'm going to illustrate with this example that we did, well, in the lab that I was working in Harvard. Basically, in this work, what we did was to clusterize or do a genome-wide clusterization of the CD8 T cell repertoire, or the viral CD8 T cell repertoire, in mice, BC mice, infected with influenza virus. We use BC mice, which only have two MSC1 molecules, which are KB and DB, which makes, you know, the tax of identifying T cell epitope and CD8 T cell epitope much easier. And I will not go through how we did that, you know, but basically here are summarized the results. And you can see that we predicted 100, 100 approximately, 100 peptides from the influenza virus protein, which has 4,500 amino acids. Okay, so only 100, only 100 peptides. Of those one, we tested that 82 could bind. So 82% of them binds, which is actually quite good. So we can predict binding of the peptide to MSC molecules quite well. But then you can see that of those one, of those 82 peptides, only 12 were immunogenic. Okay, so there is a big leap still between what you predict and what result to be immunogenic. And if you look in the literature, don't think that we did particularly bad in this study because actually we did quite well. In general, you can say that about 10% of predicted T cell epitopes are immunogenic after you do the testing. Okay, so this is, you know, the place where we are right now. Okay. <laughs> So, going back to the problem of the haystack, we can say, or we can summarize, you know, what I said uh, until now, that epitope prediction is not really a precise science. So, if you have one antigen that you have over there represented like a haystack, so epitope prediction, what will make the epitope, which will be the needle, it will make that needle more identifiable. identifiable. So, it will make that that needle to stand up from the background of potential candidates. But you still have a lot of potential candidates that you need to do experiment and you need to check if whether they are immunogenic or they are not immunogenic. So, with this slide, I want to bring you to the point that we need to improve the efficiency of this epitope identification. Because, you know, testing all these potential candidates has a talk in the economics of epitope identification. So we need to improve the identification or the efficiency of epitope identification. So how can we do that? So we can improve epitope prediction. So this is, you know, one way to do it. But, you know, I think, as I said at the very beginning, epitope prediction is not rocket science. So we cannot go, perhaps, you know, to the point that we can pinpoint exactly which one is the epitope, that that's not possible from, from my point of view. And because also this, has, this is not possible, so we try an alternative. And that alternative was, and that was the aim of the, of the work, to define a system to prioritize antigen for epitope identification. So on the left side, you see what's the problem. So you have a pathogen that has actually, that have, or has many, many, many antigens, not, not a single antigen. So the problem is why not to focus, or why not to choose only a few antigens. So if we are able to choose, you know, the most relevant antigen, so we will improve the efficiency of T cell epitope identification. So that, that was our, our work. And the idea, so, is clearly in which antigen will you focus, okay? So our idea was to focus on antigens that are more gifted from the point of 
the diesel epitope point of view. In other words, that they have more epitopes. More epitopes. But at the time that I was doing this work, we really didn't know, didn't know whether epitopes locate preferentially in some of the antigens. Okay? We really, we really didn't know. So the first thing that we did in this work was to check if that's the case. And to do that, to do that, basically what we did was one analysis of the CD8, again, we are working with CD8, T-cell distribution, T-cell epitope distribution, in three viruses. Hepatitis C virus, human immunodeficiency virus, and influenza A virus. The three virus are enveloped virus, RNA, Envelope virus, and I will describe you briefly, you know, each one of them because that will will be relevant for the result that we are going to get. So you see, first, the hepatitis C virus, C virus is the simplest, the, the simplest one by far. Okay, it has only three protein, so it has two protein in the envelope, E1 and E2. It has another another protein which is called that form a kind of shell. And with it, that shell, you have the genetic material. The genetic material is a positive sense RNA. And the neat thing about this virus is that the genomic material or, or the genetic material get translated into a single polyprotein. Okay? And then by processing, you get the different proteins of the virus. Actually, 10 different proteins. And the neat thing is also, if you check over there, is that in the end terminus, you find the proteins that the virus express the most at higher level. And these are the core protein, E1 and E2. Okay? So single polyprotein. So down below, you see the, the HIV virus. The HIV virus is a bit more complex, so you have one envelope, okay? And in the envelope, you have a GP120, GP41, and the line that envelope, you have another protein that is the matrix protein, and you have a capsid made by a protein called P24, and within the capsid, you have two copies of the genetic material, that in this case is also RNA, positive sense RNA, though this is a retrovirus, okay? And these, these copies of RNA encode by nine overlapping or somewhat overlapping uh, open reading frame that you can see that you can see on the right. I just want to, po to point that that gap, the protein that you see at the left, actually encode for or contain the protein that are required for the assembly of the virus. So these are the matrix protein, and these are and this is also P24. Okay, so the proteins that are more highly expressed by the virus are within GA, okay? And to end with this excretion, we have down below the influenza A virus. The influenza A virus, as you can see, has eight segments of negative sense RNA, which encode by 11 genes, you know? And in this particular case, also, the protein that gets more highly expressed is actually M1, which is a protein that is underlying the envelope of the virus, okay? So just to finish over here, just to say that protein expression in, in virus is highly regulated in a manner that in general, in general, no, and this is what happened actually, the protein that are required for protein assembly, no, for viral assembly, which are the one that you need more copy, are the one that are more highly expressed, okay? So that would be core, that would be, for example, P24, and that would be M1, okay? So these are the proteins that the virus express at higher levels. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the epitopes that we selected to do this work, because to do this work we didn't do prediction at this time, so basically what we did was to go to a database, in this case we, we went to the immune epitope database, and uh, another database which I developed myself, APMSC, and we selected epitopes with a size of between 9 and 10 residues, so this is, this is the reason for that is that this is the optimal size for binding to the MSC molecule. Okay, so we went after optimal C CTL epitopes. Okay, and then the other thing that we did was to select only those CTL epitopes in which the immunogen was infection. So that means, you know, that the, 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 the epitopes were recognized by human that had been infected by these viruses, okay? So, and in doing so, basically, 
what we are trying to do is select epitopes that are likely processed, presented, and recognized during the course of the infection. So we are very restrictive. And you can see over there the number of epitopes that we selected, 190 for HIV, 249 for HIV-1. I didn't say that we were only treating with HIV-1 and 78 by IAB. Okay? And in the next slide, what I show you is how or the mapping of these peptides, or of these peptides, or these CTL epitopes in the proteins, okay? And as you can see, at least I don't see anything really relevant, okay? So you, you can see, like, you know, sometimes hot spots, but in general, basically what you see is that if a protein is longer, so you will have more epitopes on that protein, which makes sense, you know, because, I mean, it can, it can hold more, more epitopes. But actually what we did next was to analyze whether, whether the epitopes are distributed evenly according to the size of the proteins. Okay, so you, have, you cannot see it by eye, but we apply actually a G-square test in which you, you have the formula over there. We compare for all the viruses and for each antigen we compare the difference between observed epitopes or the epitopes that match in every antigen this is O and the E that you see antigen E with the difference with the expected epitope in the, the expected epitope well the result of distributing all the epitopes in the virus in the different proteins according to the size of that protein you see the formula on the, on the right for example the expected protein the spreading epi expected epitopes for protein E will be the total epitopes on that virus multiplied by the total length and the, no, the length of protein E divided by the length of the total protein. Okay, so this is how we get. Well, and when we get this G, G square, G square values, <laughs> then you see them down below in the slides. So basically, and you see also the p-values, basically what we see is that the t-cell epitopes are not distributed evenly. Evenly, I don't know if this is you know, the, the, the proper way to say it, the proper way to say it, evenly throughout the, throughout the proton according to the size of the antigens. Okay, so what happened is that, what I'm going to show you, to visualize how was that distribution, so what we did next was to plot how much each protein contributed to the chi square. And this is what you see in panel A. And basically what you see is that protein core, for example, in HCV was the one that was contributed, contributing more to the, to the chi square. And in HIV was GAC protein. And in AEV was, as you can see, M1 protein. Okay, so the structural protein seems to contribute more to this non-homogeneous distribution of the CD8 T-cell epitope. And then when we check, you know, if this, this protein had more or less epitope uh, than the expected, this is what you see in panel B, and you can see, for example, in the protein of HCV, that core protein, have, core protein has more observed epitopes than expected, okay, by far, or, or quite many. GAG, again, has more observed peptides or epitopes than expected. This is what Yuram was already reporting, so... Until here we are all okay. And then you see in AAV, again, M1 protein, which is, you know, the Metis protein, is the one that also that has more epitopes than the one that we will expect for the size of that protein. Okay? So, the next thing, that, okay, no, sorry, sorry, before I go, and I get two answers to this thing, to, to excite it. GAP protein actually has also four different proteins within four different structural protein within that protein. So we did the same chi square analysis. And basically what we found is that the epitope on that protein are not distributed evenly according to the size of the protein that are forming that gap protein. And we saw actually that P24 again is the one with more epitope, more epitope than, than expected and the one that contributes the most to having to do to this contribution uh, to the chia square. Okay, so this is what what you can see on this on this slide. So what we did next, or what I'm going to do next, is try to explain why we are getting this non-homogeneous 
again, this is maybe not the proper way to call it, epitope distribution. So I have to say that I almost, I, I almost fall. I have to say that we cannot discard that what, what we see is simply the, is what we see is related to the fact that we are starting with a biased data set. You know, because if people have, for example, more interest in a structural protein, so basically, most likely, we are going to start with more peptides, more epitope from that protein. So we cannot discard that. So, so because we cannot do anything with that, we just, you know, we go with the other reason that could explain the epitope distribution that we see. That, that we see. And what are the reasons that could explain or could be behind the differential epitope distribution that we see? One of them is antigen presentation. So that there could be more MHC binding peptide than expected in some proteins. Okay, so that, that could explain what we see. The other thing that it could explain our distribution is sequence variability. We don't know exactly why, but I can tell you that variable proteins have more epitopes because you have more protein and you, you may have more epitopes. But I can also tell you that conserved epitopes are more easily detected. So that, that can be proven and that's, that's the case. Another reason that I'm going to explore further is related with abundance and biosynthesis. Okay? But let's start with the first one. And basically, what we proved is that MAC1 binding peptide are actually distributed homogeneously in the study viral proteins according to the size of the antigens. Okay, so how we did this thing? So we took the viral proteins, we put them together, and we predicted the peptide binding to A0801, A0301, B0702. These are three human MHC molecules, and we also predicted three MHC molecules that actually belong to three very different supertypes or belong to three different supertypes, meaning that the, the peptide binding uh, do not overlap, so that they really bind, you know, and present very different things. So, basically, with this prediction, so what we did was to carry out the same study, the chi square statistic, but in this case, observe, instead of observe epitopes, we were working with predicted peptides, okay? And you can see down below the results, and you can see the chi square values gave p-values that that basically indicated that we had an homogeneous distribution of the predicted binding peptides for each one of the MHC molecules that we tested, but also by the sum, the peptides that the sum of the peptide binding to each one of them. Okay, so this is what you see. So we conclude that the distribution of T cell epitope that, that we see, the non homogeneous distribution of T cell epitope that we see, cannot be accounted by any underlying MHC binding preference, at least in our hands and with our tools. Okay, so the second factor that could explain the distribution is conservation. But we also found that there is not correlation between conservation and the observed epitope distribution. How we arrive to this conclusion? So, to arrive to this conclusion, so we define a conservation factor, as you can see, there for each antigen, which is the number of variable sites in each antigen, divided by the total number of sites. So, this, that, that will be the length of the antigen. Okay, and a variable site for us for us was a site or a position in that antigen with one entropy greater than one given by the Sanon entropy. Okay, so we had a Leinemann and then we calculated the entropy. If the entropy was greater than one, that was a variable site. And what you see down below is actually a plot between the conservation factor and the ratio between observed and expected epitopes. And you can see that there is no correlation. The rank, the rank Spearman correlation coefficient that you see reported on top of the, of the plots is very small, and it's actually, it is not statistically uh, different from zero, as you can see by the p-value. So, there is no correlation between variability and the epitope distribution that we see. So, we only have one, one, uh, 
at least you know, in, in, in my mind at the time, so one other thing that could explain the distribution that we were seeing that was related to translation, translation and protein abundance. And before I enter to explain you know, my reasoning, so I want to remind you that antigen presentation by MSC is coupled both with antigen degradation and translation. It is very easy to see that it's related with degradation because the proteosome generates most of the peptides that are presented by MHC1. Most of them. There is no degradation. There is no, almost no presentation. Okay? Almost no presentation. But there are two substrates that the proteosome can degrade. So one is protein that needs to be retired. Okay? As you can see on the right. But it also degradates and these are the main substrates, defected ribosomal products. And these defected ribosomal products, called DRIPS, actually, they result, or they result from translation. So the more translation, the more DRIPS you have, and the more presentation you have, actually. Think five minutes. Actually, <laughs> I started five minutes later. Okay, okay. So the more translation, the more translation you also see, the more the more translation you see the more uh, the more presentation it's been shown that most of the epitopes actually uh, most of, of epitopes are derived from newly synthesized proteins so there are a couple of papers or several papers that show that so in that particular case you can see that protein abundance so can be related to translation so if this is the case that we see that we see more epitopes in the protein that are made the most, so it's related, could be related to translation. But there is another factor that, well, we cannot account for, that is stability. Okay, so this is, we cannot account for stability in this particular case. But in the case of hepatitis C virus, actually, we can address more specifically the impact of translation and protein abundance in shaping, shaping, in shaping the distribution of the T-cell epitope. And this is the reason. Look, you know, let me remind you that ACV, there is only one polyprotein, okay, you see it at the bottom, only one polyprotein, that the protein that are ma most abundant are at the end terminus, okay, so we, we also know that, and we also know that the epitopes locate preferentially at the core protein, which is, you know, the one that is at the end terminus. So here what I did is actually is a correlation between the discount or the C terminus of each protein to the end terminus of the polyprotein with regard to the ratio between observed epitopes and expected epitopes. Okay, that, that ratio. And you can see that actually there is a positive correlation that is quite good, 0 0.68, and that is statistically significant. Okay? So now, with these results, we can actually arrive to this conclusion. Yes, and the conclusion is the following, is that epitope distribution in HCV actually suggests an ingenious regulation of protein expression related to early translational termination. I'm sorry I couldn't put it in less words, you know, but this is what I meant. And here, here is the explanation. See, in HCV, hepatitis C virus, we know that the genome gets translated, gets Related in a single in a single in a single polyprotein. Okay, we know that we have more protein at the end terminus, so we have more protein of C, E1, and E2. But look, you know, if there was all the time a complete translation of the polyprotein, so the polyprotein was made all the time. So, and if we see less protein, less protein of those at the end terminus, that means that you have more degradation of those protein at the end terminus. Because at the C terminus, sorry, because you don't see them. So that will mean that you will see more epitopes. I'm talking about real epitopes in the C terminus. And this is not what happened at all. We see more epitopes at the end terminus. So we have to take the alternative hypothesis. The terminal hypothesis, what it says is that we have, or we have to conclude that we have a kind of incomplete translation. So most of the time, or many times, the polyprotein doesn't get translated entirely. So the ribosome falls off of the RNA. And then that will explain why you have more epitopes at the end terminus, okay? 
and why you have also more concentration of the protein that are located at the endoterminus. Okay? Because that explains the result that we see. So the conclusion are here. Proteins, proteins making the structure of the virus pack more epitope than the expected by the size. I suggest that we should focus uh, to prioritize uh, epitope identification on a structural protein. So Juram will disagree with me with that. So maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think that the, the, the very neat thing is that in virus whose entire protein result from a single translated polyprotein, our research suggests that protein expression levels are controlled by the proximity of the protein to the initiation of the relation. Thus, placing a structural protein at the end terminal of a long translated open reading frame is likely a means to guarantee the high copy number required of those proteins for viral assembly. That makes sense. Virus such as ACV are very simple. You need very simple explanation to explain why the virus, you know, needs to make more protein for assembly than the other. Okay, so this is a nice and simple explanation that fits with the data that we are getting. And I just want to thank you for listening. I hope that you could understand me something. I know that my English is thick. I've been told a couple of times about that. And I want to thank you to Carmen Diaz Rivero. She did the work, this work with me. And I want to thank also the institution where I work, that they pay me, and this is great. And also the funding agency, that is the Spanish Ministry, the, the Community of Madrid, and also I collaborate with, uh, with a company called Immunotech. And thank you very much thank you for listening. Any questions?